We'll add in an edit button, fix Twitter's problems. And what's new in Windows 11 for business users? Vertical Hold is proudly brought to you by Aussie Broadband. Changing the game with their award-winning network and Australian-based support. Hi there. Welcome back once again to Vertical Hold Behind the Tech News. I'm sure you know the spiel by now. We're the tech podcast where we catch up with Australia's leading tech journalists to dive into the big tech stories of the week. The label on my underwear tells me that I'm Alex Kidman and I'm not inclined to check and I'm going to take it on faith that my partner in crime here is Adam Turner. Hang on, I'll just check my undies. Oh, no, these aren't mine. Be very glad that the, the, <laughs> this is not a webcam show, people. That's all I'm going to say. What I'm also going to say, actually, I'm not going to stop there, is that, uh, hey, Adam, this week, Chinese scientists revealed robotic magnetic gloop that should one day be able to climb inside your body, I swear I'm not making this up, and perform surgery. Nothing can go wrong with sentient robot putty doctors, oh, right? Well, not, not when you make it sound so good like that. I mean, all I can picture is that episode of Futurama where Fry gets parasites from an egg sandwich at a truck stop vending machine, and it's the best thing that ever happened to him. So if it's good enough for Fry, it's good enough for me. Right. Okay. So so we're volunteering Adam to be the first man on the uh, yeah. the human testing rack for that one, clearly. Also making his way into the virtual Vertical Hold Studios is Finder Editor Angus Kidman. Gus, I'm not going to ask you about sentient robot gloop yet, because... Frankly, sir, you've been living the dream. A few weeks ago, we talked about robots making pizzas in Aldi supermarkets. Again, not making this up. Seriously, folks, go look up and listen to episode 367 and you'll hear what I mean. And you have personally walked into robot pizza nirvana. What's a robot pizza actually like? Spare us no details. Well, in a single word, it's overpriced. (laughs) That was my biggest complaint. I took myself all the way to an Aldi in North Sydney, which is, you know, just uh, hell hole really um but <laughs> i tried out the robot pizza vending machine and it was adequate and it kind of produced the pizza in two minutes and but you paid nine bucks for a slice of pizza like this Ooh. is for nine bucks for one slice of pizza it's not and, darling you know, harbor <laughs> <laughs> it is not um although it does have a lot of the same reflective glass but yeah so i was kind of yeah i was underwhelmed by the robot pizza experience and i really wanted to be say be able to say that i for one would welcome our robot pizza overlords but actually i'm going to have to give it a thumbs down and if i head to aldi it will just be to pick up my own underwear right so and possibly just one of their frozen pizzas where you know the box tastes better than the pizza well i think if you combine the two you can yeah you can come up with a really good sort of yeah side dish to go with the pizza so sure let's go with that sounds good So this week, Microsoft's announced what it sees as the future of work and how Windows will work within that and nothing about robotic pizza machines. But we will be diving into the code and considerations of Windows 11 for work directly. But first, Twitter. It's been a big week for Twitter with a new board member, some guy called Elon Musk. Sounds like a made up name to me. And the intriguing promise that they're going to trial having an edit button. It's been something of a holy grail, the idea of an edit button for Twitter users for many years now. But is it one of those things we should be careful about what we wish for? Gus, what specifically has Twitter said it's going to do? Well, as is the case, it said suspiciously little. It said one thing in a tweet, and now we're going to interpret it for 20 minutes because this is the way <laughs> that the Twitterverse do. works. Um, but yes, Twitter has come out and said that, yes, it has been working for some time since last year on introducing an edit feature for Twitter so that you could correct those annoying typos. And we've all been there. You type a message and you think, wow, I look even stupider than I normally do on social media because people do think I can spell. Um, so, yeah, there's been a long standing demand for this. There's a kind of running gag, which is yeah, anytime you do a typo, you just reply to it with like tweets, but editable to sort of <laughs> highlight that you know you've done something stupid. So Twitter has said that it is going to give us this option to actually edit tweets. But there's a massive caveat, apart from the fact that I said they're testing it, is that they're only going to roll it out for Twitter Blue, which is this kind of weird paid service for Twitter, which exists. I I, must, I don't think I know anyone who uses it. I don't know a single person who's on there unless Adam's doing it on the sly. No, I was actually <laughs> going to ask you guys, has anybody figured out a reason to pay for Twitter Blue yet? 
Well, the edit button might be it, I suppose, if it's a feature that people really want so badly. Have they said it's only for Twitter Blue or they said it's just going to be with Twitter Blue users first while they test it out? I, you could interpret it either way because, again, we're basically going off a single yeah, tweet. Going yeah, going on a, yeah. a handful of words. Yeah. You can imagine that, yeah, certainly the, the initial trial of doing it will be with Twitter Blue users. And, yeah, if they're ever going to get people to pay for Twitter, they will need to have a compelling feature. And it's hard to work out. Short of promising that your tweets will be promoted a lot, it's hard to work out what else that might be. So I won't be surprised if it's locked into either Twitter Blue or Twitter Blue and maybe they allow it to like you know, select high-profile individuals, say people with the surname Musk or something might be allowed to do it as well. I could visualise that scenario. Well, speaking of Musk and the reason why I brought him up is because he's now a Twitter board member, having bought a stupendous quantity of shares in the company. And he ran a poll asking people if they wanted an edit button and being Elon Musk, of course, one of the answers was YSE for yes or on for no, because he's a twerp, that man, in my professional opinion, <laughs> allegedly, just in case the lawyers are listening. But, uh, I mean, he got like 74% yes. Gus, doesn't that point to, to Twitter users really wanting that feature? I'm going to say no, because I just don't want to say that people who follow Elon Musk are automatically right about things. So I think this is very much a case of, yeah, yeah, two wrongs don't make a right. But yeah, I think obviously there would be some demand. And the thing that people always bring up when they discuss this is that other platforms have managed to do it. You know, yeah, Facebook in particular has an edit option. You can go in and make a correction if you made a typo. So the prevailing wisdom seems to be that if, you know, an alleged maniac like Zuckerberg can introduce it, then an alleged maniac like Dorsey or Musk could also introduce it. <laughs> so what's the difference then? Why why should I be allowed to edit Facebook? Because it doesn't seem to be controversial. You don't hear people saying very often, oh, I can't believe they let me edit my Facebook post. What what's the difference? The big difference, and I think and I think there is a slight and subtle difference which Twitter is leaning into is the fact that Twitter really is more of an open discourse that's become a kind of record of what people are saying and doing. A lot of Facebook is still more private and it's not out there and visible to people. So yeah. the impact of the change is the same. Retweeting is a big part of Twitter. Imagine if you everyone retweets something and then you change the message to say the reverse. That's going to potentially cause problems. You don't see that happening in the same way on Facebook because that kind of interaction doesn't exist. So I think that's why... The concern is there, and Twitter has said, look, it's big concerns to say, look, this is a public record, so we do need to be mindful of that. So one obvious thing they would do, and this is what happens on Facebook and on every other platform I've seen with editing like this, if you've edited a message, there's a thing that goes on the end to say edited so that you know that hasn't happened. And it seems likely, I suspect, that if Twitter goes down this route, it'll also be a bit like Wikipedia you'll be able to see the edit history. If you want to see what the tweet said beforehand, you'll be able to do that. I think if they can put that feature in place, that would help. And then the final thing that's been talked about is maybe there's a time limit. And again, we know with their undo feature, you have a, there's a time limit before you can use it. So that and undo I, feature, I wanted to ask you about that. That's part of Twitter Blue, isn't it? Yes. Does that actually let you change tweets or is that that Gmail thing of we won't actually send it for a little while in case you change your mind? It's the latter. It's the, yeah. here's a bit of a pause while you think about this tweet and work out so nobody else you can, can see in fact it, yeah. spell the word fish. Yeah. Um, but but it's, it's probably the reason why you might think about paying for Twitter Blue right now. Um, but Gus, I was, the, the edit history thing is something that interests me, um, as referencing Wikipedia, because I know you personally are someone who's pedantic enough to have done this. How many people are actually going to look at edit histories? Because you've done it, I've done it, we've kind of, dug into the edit history it can be quite entertaining for certain yeah. controversial topics but for these kinds of things i think a lot of people especially within that space of twitter because it's still fairly small a lot of people might notice that there's a little edit star or a check mark or whatever but are they really going to dive into the history to go oh wait a minute this person completely reversed their position well n- not always but i do think sometimes because people do track what goes on there are already those services that track tweets in real time and this is very useful if people do decide to just you know <laughs> go right out of their way and try and pretend they didn't happen. Obviously, when you've got those prominent political figures, I think there will be people who will track them in those instances. So if something is echoing around a lot, you can also imagine that in that scenario, Twitter might go in for one of its warnings. It loves a warning. One of those things that pops and says, hey, this is actually controversial. This is actually proven. They might pop a thing and say, this has been significantly edited. This may have been written by Donald Trump. Yeah. Yeah. um, (laughs) I think there's maybe an obvious answer that they haven't thought of here. I haven't talked about it. Looking at it from a different metric, 
Because the, the big concern seems to be that what if something that I write and then gets shared by a lot of people who say, yeah, I agree with you, and then I change it to say something about how wonderful Hitler is. And it's like, oh, my God, how do we let him do that? I think what they need to do is rather than have a time limit, actually say you can't edit it after it has been liked or shared X number of times. I think that that could well come into the mix. Like I said, yeah. we haven't seen this live yet, and they've talked about limitations. And I could imagine maybe there's a kind of, yeah, once it's accelerated a certain distance, you're stuck with it. Yeah, um, so if I put it up and realise after 10 seconds, oh, I made a stupid typo, well, chances are it hasn't been shared by 500,000 people or liked by a lot of people, so it's easy for me to get in and change it. It's no big deal. But for me to turn around the next day after you know it's been shared and go, oh, by the way, I want to change mine, I think that's a fair... Most people, I think, would would agree that that's a a fair compromise. But I can see the exact problem for this, and uh, his name is Elon Musk. He's a professional shit stirrer. He He really is. But but he's he's a good example of where that model wouldn't work, because if he tweets something, or if you get someone who's followed by millions of people, 10 seconds could be all it takes to hit that limit. But that's his problem. At which point you can't edit it. But that's his problem. For most people, it won't be a problem. It'll only be a problem for hand people. Yeah, that's he's, exactly. He's on the board, and that's he can go into the back end and fix it. For your average person, they don't experience that, so the ability to edit still works for him. Stiff, but yeah. there's there's another problem here, which has been an issue for Twitter in the past, especially around celebrity accounts. But it could happen elsewhere as well. Which is if your account is compromised, because then not only are you potentially sending out tweets talking about you know dodgy Twitter spam or. Uh, you know, mail order brides or whatever the current spam du jour is, I'm not entirely sure, they could go back and edit other tweets that you've done and create kind of chains around your your viral content. And again, those could already have been shared. They might be a past whatever this limit you're talking about imposing would be, and then you might be stuck with them even when and if you can regain control of oh, your Oh, because you've got to get back in and then convince Twitter it wasn't you who made the change. I can exactly. imagine how much fun yeah, that yeah. would be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not much fun to deal with at the best of times. Yeah. But when something like that happens, and if your tweets have suddenly been edited to indicate something ridiculous, like you think eggplant is a reasonable vegetable, then uh, which obviously no sane person would, uh, then you've got a big problem. So uh, one of Elon Musk's first moves is going to be like banning, you know, eggplant-based hate speech. Obviously, like whether we'll be allowing that in this scenario. Do you think people though do just think about this as typos? Is there is is there a difference between uh, an edit function which is basically spell check and an edit function with which is oh no, I didn't mean to say that people should invest in my dodgy NFT scheme or whatever. It is, it, it's really hard to say without people using it. And I think in some ways, what, what's the practical difference between being able to undo a message so people hadn't seen it and, you know, then, so, then so the delete function you've collected. already got. Yeah, hmm. you've got delete function, but if you've got the undo function and then you just fix the one thing, like, they, it all feels to me like it started to converge, but I think we'd have to see if people seen it, but how will they respond to it? Like, lots of people on Twitter have got used to this. You just carry on and you act like you've made a typo. Like, the immediacy is what Twitter is about. So I yeah, it's one of these things. Now that we everyone's got very excited that it's going to come in there, do I feel like it's a feature most people would use once Twitter came in? Probably not. I think most people would just go on the way they do now because people who are obsessed with Twitter are obsessed about this stuff, and for a lot of other people, the only time they hear about it is when the Daily Mail embeds it in some story about Elon Musk. And that's when you change your Twitter handle to say "stuff you Daily Mail" or whatever. I mean, that's a trick lots of people have used already. If you get an embedded tweet, you change your 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 handle to something offensive and then it will come up that way. Yes, and yeah, Adam does this without changing his name. <laughs> harsh. <A> bit harsh. <laughs> Speaking of professional shit stirrers, <laughs> great to have you back on the show. <laughs> Never again. So Windows 11 has been around for a while, and like all versions of Windows, they they bang on in one area about how great it is for consumers and how everybody should upgrade. But there's also the business side of it as well. Now, Gus, you're a guy who's been using Windows since it was in short pants. What have we seen from Windows 11 from from how you would use it at work? What are they telling us that's interesting? 
Well, we've had, yeah, we've had a big event this week. It was known as the hybrid work event. And it was really, it was, yeah, it was Microsoft's chance to set out its stall and say, hey, these are some of the amazing things you'll be able to do with Windows 11 specifically. And you're always going to get that message later because we know business adoption of these things always lags. Mm. Companies have to plan for this stuff. So sort of having it happen about now makes sense, especially because of all these many features they announced and that we're going to get into. None of them are expected to come out any earlier than October, and some of them will be later than that. So it's very much a case of we're teasing you with some stuff now. We want you to get excited about it, but you're not going to switch on your Windows 11 machine tomorrow and go, wow, here's all this amazing new stuff because it isn't actually appearing like that. So, yeah, we can sort of dig through those things. But I think, yeah, the the overriding message that Microsoft wants to get out there is, hey, yeah, businesses, you should really try to get some Windows 11 there in the mix. And we think it's because it's really good for you and not just because we want to sell you some more licenses. One of the big things, though, that they did focus in on, and which is reasonable enough, is the fact that the way people are using their computers has changed so much in the past couple of years. So many more people working from home, so much more kind of virtualization, so much more need for computer systems that can work outside the office. Um, So let's dig into some of the detail of what they announced. On the very, very minor side, um, they announced that... uh, uh, File Explorer browsing will add tabs. Um, Gus, are you are you excited by tabs coming to the to to File Explorer? Is it going to change the world? No, it's not. And I'll tell you why. I mean, and and I actually I use File Explorer, which I suspect a lot of people don't these days. They don't even think about it. It's not a particularly new feature because, as we, in fact, a feature like this has been in Mac OS for a while. So it's hmm. certainly not a new idea. The reason I think it's maybe not that exciting in Windows is that something that Windows has had for a long time is actually always had really good, sophisticated, snapping your windows around the screen kind of things to line the stuff up. The grouping setup, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah why, can't Ma- why can't Macs do that? <laughs> yeah, Actually, well, yeah. like... That would be lovely for Mac users. I agree. Yeah. But in practice, I don't know that there's much difference between being able to tab through all your open um, you know, file things and just have a few of them neatly lined up and snapped together. Like between yeah. that and the alt tab key, I feel like, look, it's a nice little addition. It means they're building it out. But for me, it's like, no, I think if I need to have multiple things visible, even on a laptop screen, I think Windows has handled that pretty well for quite a while. So this to me seems like a nice new thing. If I end up using it, it'll be because I bet they match it to the same keyboard shortcut that you use to open tabs in a browser. And I'm going to do it without thinking about it and go, oh, yeah, I could do that. So that's where I think that's going to land. But I think for some people, potentially, that will be exciting. I'm also, as everyone knows, yeah, I'm a bit of a tab zealot in browsers. And I say, if you've got more than nine of them, then I think there's something fundamentally wrong with you. And I know from looking at all the many other journalists and colleagues, I know that most people have 200 of these open. So I imagine that will be happening in File Explorer as well. I might have to get you to have a chat to my son as well. He would always, he's in uni now and he got a new computer, but he'd always complain how slow his, his high school computer was. And he'd have like 20 tabs open or whatever. That, but the behind that would be another 20 tabs of YouTube. <laughs> I couldn't understand why his computer would run slow. But yeah, obviously he ha- he didn't know anyone who was a tech expert who he could turn no, to. He, could he tell wouldn't about listen that. to anyone who was a tech <laughs> expert. There's a difference. Well, speaking of listening to people, one of the other things that has changed in the past couple of years is we're all doing a whole host more virtual meetings. And I'm going to say a word that's going to make Adam shudder, Microsoft Teams. Oh, the 11th plague of Egypt. But surprisingly... <laughs> Microsoft's pitch on virtual meetings wasn't just Teams. This is stuff that's going to be baked into Windows 11 with better um, noise reduction and background blur and what it's calling AI-led eye contact. Gus, what are they doing with AI and my eyes? It's 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 like it's uh, it's slightly creepy in a jar, but it is a quite interesting idea. So the notion with this eye contact stuff, which they have tried out a little bit on a couple of Surface models, so it's not completely completely new, is the notion that if you're talking, the meeting will the camera will constantly make sure that your eyes are focused. So if you're moving around, it will be able to yeah sort of make sure that you're still looking at things, and that could be helpful if you're kind of getting distracted, like you know, and the dog walks in. It could be bad if you're sneakily trying to watch the cricket on the side and the eyes, you know, the eyes kind of keep sliding in a weird way. But it's this idea that, oh, we could actually use some locally based artificial intelligence. And they said it'll be on the system. So they're not uploading this stuff. So it's not a lot of your private data. And there's a similar, this other feature called voice focus, which is designed to sort of make sure your voice can be more clearly heard. It cuts out background noise. Um, so there's, it, yeah, it's a nifty sounding concept. But, but hang on, is, isn't it drawing fake eyes on you though? Did I totally miss? I thought the way this thing worked is that 
if you were talking and you were looking a little bit off to the side, it would redraw your eyes and draw fake white and fake pupil to make it look like you were looking right down the barrel. Did I misunderstand that? I didn't think it was quite as Microsoft painty as that. Well, that's what that's why I'm worried about. <laughs> yeah. Alex, Alex, what's your understanding? Of uh, that your, Adam, your take is the take that I have on it. Although we should point out, they have said it relies on actually having a neural processing unit to do this which basically means when it launches later this year, it'll mostly, and weirdly, it'll be the ARM-based Windows 11 system. So your Surface Pro X and Samsung, there's a few of them out there, but not many. And it's one of those rare instances where there's a feature that's going to be on Windows 11, which is going to be on ARM first rather than x86. You know it'll go badly, though. You know it'll have (laughs) a problem with, like, it'll struggle with certain complexions or... Uh, skin tones or it'll struggle with people with disabilities and people with one eye will have a fake eye drawn on them or something horrendous like that you're not even calling out the obvious one and i've got to point this out to the listeners won't know this but both the other gentlemen on this call are wearing glasses and i think that could just throw them right off so So here here i was thinking it's some subtle commentary on why you shouldn't pirate windows because the eye patch won't work (laughs) it'll just it'll look bad or, mm. or if you move your head too quickly and there's a lag and the eyes like have fallen behind, uh, they they um blur yeah. behind you, zig, zig around. Like it's I like mean, playing. You could play pong with your eyes on the screen. People will enjoy that. I mean, you'll remember back when Google for the first rolled out the ability to do things like put stupid hats on you during video calls, and we all yeah. Like but this that, is like a <laughs> business call. This is not a stupid hats call to your brother. This is a, supposed to be a business call. But no, this is hi- this is hybrid work, Adam. Like now we're blurring oh, the lines. Right. So we're allowed to do that. Home, so all we're right. allowed to do this stuff. And all we've right. already had that case in the in the U the legal case in the US where the guy was stuck being a cat. I think it was, and, oh, and kept yeah. pleading that he wasn't a cat. It's it's just the advancement of that. But moving on, because there was quite a lot here. Um, Virtual machines, obviously, they're nothing new in the business space. And Microsoft's had kind of some cloud PC stuff baked within Office 365 for a while. But it's now talking about having cloud PCs inside Windows 11. This is a concept that my brain struggles to deal with. But it's the idea that I think that you can boot directly into a cloud PC from a Windows 11 PC. Gus, what's the, what's the business angle here? I, I'm not entirely following this one. So, no, really, I mean, the, the way you've explained it is actually pretty accurately how it was presented by Microsoft, that you could do exactly that. It really comes down to what's not a new idea about virtual machines and these things. It's like in a work environment, you might want someone to have a very controlled system, but they might also be doing that on a PC where outside of that, they want to do a lot of, you know, local processing. So, um, and maybe, yeah, literally it might still be their work machine. So they might be saying, oh, when you're doing all the stuff, when you're having like these sensitive meetings, we want you doing that through a virtual system that we can completely control. But then maybe on the side, you're also sitting there doing a lot of video editing, which is still one of those things that works better if you do it on a local system. So really, it's the idea that you've just got more control over how a machine usually works. So you can have that level of enterprise control. But at the same time, it's easier to say we could also take advantage of the underlying hardware because sometimes it's been a more a case of, oh, right, well, if you're running a virtual machine, why don't you have a really dumb, stupid kind of box there. Like if you're bringing it up mm. in a brand, yeah, if you're bringing it up that in a cloud. That feels very like <laughs> late 90s. Wasn't that what Sun mm. and others were doing or pushing as the future of, you know, work computing at that time? Oh, you take me back to the the humble joys of the network PC, remember? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. And like, but yeah, so but that's the thing. On a network PC, like those, really, they were dumb terminals. Like, And when mm. we were writing about them and I was writing about them when they came out, the point we were making is, well, this is not that much different to having things on a mainframe. It's like, yeah, mm. dumb terminal, processing happening offline. The big difference here with this, you know, if you've got the idea of can you boot into a cloud PC or a Windows 11 machine is you've got a powerful box in front of you with its own local operating system, but you can very easily as a user spin up into that virtualized system. And that's the kind of thing that previously you had to be a kind of, you know, a VMware tragic or a, you know, a Windows virtual machine tragic to know how to do that. It wasn't an easy thing. If you build it into the thing, so literally swapping between those computers in the Microsoft vision is as simple as moving between monitors in a multi-monitor setup. Like that's kind of the vision they're going for. Is this streaming? Like, like, cause we talked about streaming games the other week and how that can be a bit of a shit show depending on what your broadband's like. Are you actually streaming that computer from the cloud? And therefore, if you've got dodgy broadband, is it not going to work so well? No, not necessarily because you might actually be still accessing the virtual machine instance, but on your machine. Like, yeah, this does get a bit Inception-like at this point. So, <laughs> so it comes down and it comes from the internet 
and runs as a, a little its own little application on your computer. So therefore, if your internet's still a bit flaky, that's okay because what's happening is happening on your computer, not like when you're streaming a game and all the game processing is happening up in the cloud. So not much is happening on your computer except for the display. So if the internet goes dodgy, then the whole thing's stuffed. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not that. It's not that literal Halo kind of scenario where yeah. you're freaking about, um, you know, whether or not things are going to come in. So it's still, it's kind of, it's it's getting very Schrodinger's VM at this point because it's yeah. there and not there, and you could flip between the two of them with appropriate op- operating system support. Also, obviously, you want some good security there. That ties in with it being Windows 11 because, of course, big lockdown with that still is, you know, that you've got to have the TPU in there. You know, we're, lo- we're loading up processes in these things now. It's like CPU plus TPU plus MPU to actually get to, you know, do what you want to do. It's getting pretty busy, although the gaming thing is interesting because this does rely on Microsoft's Azure platform. If they hadn't done the gaming thing, I'd be thinking, well, this is really ambitious, but Games are very, you know, lag intensive, visually intensive, data intensive, the whole shebang. And yes, we've seen some problems with it, but also we've seen how it can work really well. For business processes, when you're throwing around less data, I can actually see this working a whole lot better. In a sense, the the Xbox gaming thing becomes the proving ground for them to say, right, well, that's bleeding edge stuff. That's the stuff where you suffer a bit because we're trying to do a lot. We're trying to do a bit less here, so it should be a lot smoother, I think. It should, and I mean, and again, it's not literally necessary. That's a streaming thing. It is kind of in some ways you have got the VM running locally. And but let's be clear, it's an it's an interesting edge case because some people, some businesses won't worry about it because they'll still want things to run locally. And of course, the big direction for these things has actually been, yeah, the irrelevance of the operating system in a way because so many business apps now you access them through a browser anyway. Most of the stuff that's going on is not happening there. But there are still lots of things where that's not the case. There's lots of legacy apps that go back you know, decades and that people still want to be able to run in some ways. And this is another context where you might have that little, you might be you might be booting into a virtual machine that's running something ancient and horrible like Windows XP because your bank has decided that's still where all this client stuff's going. But then for half the day- It's a better can, bank. <laughs> well, undoubtedly, um, <laughs> other banks are available. But um, I think there, there yeah, we do know that like business change is really slow. Like, you know, so it takes a long time and giving them the ability to have this thing where you could do, that's the thing, once you're running a cloud PC, it can be completely different to what you're running in your main operating system. So it really can make that easier. And again, we've had versions of that before. We've had, you know, bits of Windows 95 emulators hiding even in some of the consumer versions of Windows subsequently. So it does happen, but the, the proof of that one will be in the, you know, very complex enterprise deployments that, um, you know, yeah, people will be playing around with over the next couple of years. And once we actually see this stuff come out, it'll be interesting to see what they do with it. Well, speaking of complex enterprise deployments, one of the complexities that often makes IT admins cry is patching and updating machines. And Microsoft was also talking about auto patching. And I'm guessing this is not applying a small, cute, fluffy dog to Windows 11. Well, I mean, yeah, that'll be the NFT strategy. And we'll discuss that another time. (laughs) No, um, I actually, I think the auto patching thing I found really interesting, and that's possibly a tragic reflection on me in terms of what I think is exciting. Um, we're obviously used to the idea that actually, you know, Windows is can be quite aggressive about pushing out updates, even to consumers. Like it's much harder to keep your machine from updating itself as a Windows machine than it is with a Mac. And I know yes. this more with friends with Macs I've supported where the first thing I was like, you're two versions, like you're two years out of, out of date on the patches. You might want to do something about that. But... So there's always been there's always been this ability to for it to at a consumer level to say, oh, you have to update now, we're gonna do a forced mm-hmm. update. But in enterprise scenarios, that doesn't happen. The reason being that enterprises go, oh, we want to test this, we've got to make sure it works with our set of apps, so we're gonna try it out. What auto patching kind of does is it basically does all that for you without you thinking about it. It says, Oh, here's a new patch. We know how many users you've got. We're going to divide them into groups automatically and just start pushing the updates out to them without telling you about it. And as long as there's no problems, we're going to take it from group one to group two to group three. And I actually think that's pretty cool. If you can actually just have a computer do that rather than having some admin sit there and try and work that stuff out, that does make a lot of sense to me. So if they can get that to work, and I'm sure they'll be good just while they're beta testing it, I think that's an interesting way of saying, hey, let's use we were talking about, yeah, you get computers to do things that they do well. Computers are going to manage that process of saying, wherever we roll this stuff out, a hell of a lot better than your typical schlub sitting there knocking back coffee and trying to deal with these things while some insane CEO is yelling at him about how there's not an edit button yet. So, <laughs> so they're A-B testing their patches. 
Yeah, but it's individual company by company A-B testing almost. It's like, right, we test it in a small group of people who we think are yeah. representative users. Then if it works, we roll if, it out. Why did, well, it's not if a, it works or if nobody complains. Or if the, a little if, bit, a little, if the A group doesn't include the CEO. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. a little bit of both. It's not really A-B testing, though, because I guess A-B testing really involves, oh, we're trying to choose between two versions. This is saying yeah. we're just making sure this version's okay, but it's doing it in a highly automated way where you're not being so involved in it. You can change those decisions if you want to, but by default, you can just kind of flick a switch and say, hey, we can do this. And there was the cute thing that says, hey, now, you know, the first Tuesday of the month, which is normally yeah, Patch Tuesday and everything goes well, is just like any other Tuesday. Life just goes on as normal and systems are checked. So if they can get that to work, for enterprise users, I think that's going to be really exciting. If they can't get it to work, it's going to lead to lots and lots of people writing really, really angry stories. And we might be at the point with Windows where we're about due for that. Mm. Yeah, it's been a while. That were our bread and butter for a while. Let's go back to the good old days. <laughs> no, I think it's going to be a real trust issue for a lot of businesses, though. There'd be a lot of uh, administrators right now shaking their going, no way in hell am I using that. Yeah, exactly. And I think possibly the battle will be between, you'll have some admins who are like, hey, fine, I'll test this out on a subset and see if I like it. What you might have is some pressure from the business to say, hey, why are we paying for people to do this when Microsoft tells us that the new Shiny can do that? So look forward to some exciting boardroom discussions there. <laughs> so what you're saying is lots of IT admins will be going, no way in hell I'm doing this, but I'd better keep my yap shut because it might cost me my job. Yeah. So yeah, the more things change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> Well, that just about wraps up another episode of Vertical Hold. Thanks to Gus for joining us for the show. Pleasure as always. And you're an old hand in the virtual Vertical Hold studios. You know you're about to face the Vertical Hold three questions Oh doom. I'll ask them. You can answer them in any order you like. Where can people find your work online? Where can they find your social media online? And our new big contentious question, in the Hollywood big blockbuster epic made of your life, who's playing you? Oh, good question. All right, so we'll start with the easier one. So people can find my work, including the full review of the whole Aldi robotic piece of experience at finder.com.au. They can find me on socials on Twitter at GusWorldAU. I've not got Twitter blue, so I'll not be undoing anything, and I have not <laughs> been asked to beta test the edit thing yet. Who is going to play me in the movie of my life? Ooh. I'm just going to go completely sideways and suggest it should be Robbie Coltrane. I can see that. I can see that working. <laughs> well, there you go. And as always, you can catch us online at verticalhold.au on Twitter, at verticalhold.com.au on the web, or via the Vertical Hold Facebook page. And once again, thanks everyone for tuning in. Elon, if you're listening, yeah, we meant every word of it. <laughs> <laughs> so don't forget to, you know, Elon, tell your friends about us. Leave us a review on your podcasting platform of choice and help us spread the good word while we're still in business in 2022. <laughs>